What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the UFC Vegas 54, a four-card breakdown show with yours truly, Cage. Welcome back, my co-host, Jim. He just came back from London. How was your trip? It was great, man. Um, didn't get to meet up with any of the English fighters. Miss Brandon Lochne uh, by a day. But uh, mm-hmm. it was a great trip. Uh, I definitely re- uh, recommend it to anybody who wants to go. Go there. Go to London. It's great. Of course, like I said before, we're here to uh, do our four-card breakdown for UFC Vegas 54, which is headlined by a light heavyweight top five matchup between Alexander Rakic going up against Jan Jovic. Before we get into that, as always, this is Cage My IQ, uh, the best place for MMA content. You can follow us and subscribe to us on social media, on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch and YouTube. We are back now on the Cage My IQ YouTube channel. We're still partnered with the, the Fighters First Network, but we've gone back to the YouTube channel to plug in all of our videos. So all we ask for you guys to do, if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel uh, at Cage My IQ, and then also smash the like button down below on this video and hit us up in the comments section. And give us your picks for this Saturday's UFC Vegas 54. Uh, We also want to give a shout out to our sponsor at High Tide Herbal. Uh, Before we get into the promo code for that, if you don't know who High Tide Herbal is, check out this video right now. Offering high quality, sustainable products with all natural lab tested ingredients. It's High Tide Herbal's mission to help others live the longest, healthiest, and most productive lives possible. Their hemp derived CBD products have a wide variety of uses from helping sore muscles to skin hydration and minimizing skin irritation. They generate results based on your specific needs. Elevate your lifestyle with the new wave of wellness. Visit HighTideHerbal.com to learn more. Once again, that's High Tide Herbal. We're running the promo with our sponsor right now. If you go buy anything on the website, which is www.hightideherbal.com, all we you need to do is put in the promo code down below, KHMIIQ10, to receive 10% off your purchase. Once again, just go to checkout, put in promo code KHMIIQ10 to receive 10% off your next purchase at High Tide Herbal. We got an 11-fight bout set for you uh, for UFC Vegas 54. What was your thoughts on this fight card when it was first announced, Jim? I love the main event. Um, I really like this card. I think it's going to be, one again, one of those underrated uh, fight cards of the year because there's really good matchups on here. There's matchups that you you may not know the fighters because a few are making their debut. Uh, there's some post uh, rescheduled bouts from a few weeks ago. There's a, a fighter jumping up in weight. There's a title contender matchup as your heavyweight uh, championship or, or your light heavyweight championship title uh, to contender matchup. And then obviously it's an 11 card fight. So it's a very intimate, not a huge 15, 16 uh, fight bout or bouts on the card. Yeah, it's definitely a nice compliment right after uh, UFC 274. Yeah. Uh, that they had 15 fights. The card in itself was very exciting. And now you come back to the to the fight night uh, uh, the cards, and this is a perfect one to uh, to come right after a pay per view. It has good, just like you said, you got the main event and co main event, which has four uh, top fifteen ranked light heavyweights, and then you have a couple of uh, rescheduled fights that are sprinkled in towards the back, which kind of actually helped out this card with those yep. uh, rescheduled fights got put into this spot. But uh, other than that, let's get started with the action. We're going to go down to the first fight on the prelim. We have a middleweight matchup between Nick Maximoff going up against Andre Petrosky. Uh In this matchup, uh, Nick Maximoff is the heavy favorite, and Andre Petrosky is the big underdog. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight, and then who do you have winning? Yeah, I really like this matchup, um, and I think this is really an underrated fight and a great fight to kick off the card. Uh, it's a quick turnaround for both these guys. It seems just like yesterday where they both fought. Uh, this one was a tough one to pick. I know the odds are heavily on Nick Maximoff, but um, 
both of these guys are really good grapplers. I know you talked to Andre on the show previously and mm-hmm. talked about his BJJ background, going to Philly with him, uh, with the Gracie Academy over there. Um, in my mind, Petrovsky has better hands, and he's yet to be submitted, uh, while Maximov has better BJJ and a really underrated striking game. You know, he was one of those one-trick ponies a lot of people thought and then went back out in his last fight and really showed that he can go up against strikers who throw bombs and really just endure and be the aggressor. And he really impressed me in his last fight. Um, I picked against Nick Ma- uh, Nick Maximoff in his last two uh, UFC or his first two UFC fights, uh, but I'm not going to do it this time. I'm going to pick Nick Maximoff by decision. Um, I don't think he submits Pet- uh, Petrosky. I think Petrosky has a, a good enough ground game to avoid submissions. This fight I was back and forth on. Uh, of course, both of them have grappling backgrounds, jiu-jitsu. Uh, Nick Maximoff is more of a guy where he uses his uh, uh, the takedowns and he gets the fight to the mat. But he's more about control time with that. He's all about a, a, a position or, uh, or control, I should say, over uh, action. Uh, and he's not really good with his hands. Uh, you saw that in the Puna Soriano fight where... All, like his one priority was to get the fight to the ground. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are underestimating the fact that Petrosky has a wrestling background in himself. He wrestled in the, uh, for, uh, for a few years. He has a really high grappling background. And that was before he even joined the, uh, Daniel Gracie's gym. He's developed a, a, a jiu-jitsu background he is very really good with submission entries. In his last fight, he was able to get that submission round three on uh, Yao Zong, which showcased a lot of that. The one weakness with, uh, of course, Petrovsky, which I think people are pointing out, is his gas tank. He's been known in the past to uh, uh, gas out and tire out. But I felt like in the last fight, he was able to uh, showcase that he can manage that. And... I do like Nick Maximoff, but in this fight, I'm going Petrosky submission round one. I feel like he's gonna make a mistake. Uh, like you could, you could go up against Soriano and control him on the mat. Soriano's not gonna be a threat w- on the mat, but when you go up and your game plan uh, is to control Petrosky on the mat, I think he's gonna be in for a long night because Petrosky's gonna be able to roll around with him, reverse him. And he has better striking on top of that. I feel like his hands are a lot better. Yeah. And I feel like he's going to use that to his advantage. He's going to control uh, Maximoff with his hands. And he's going to be the, the aggressor in the, in the fight and not Maximoff. And I feel like he's going to be able to get uh, a guillotine on him uh, for the victory late in the first. Okay. I didn't think you were going to go that route. Um, I I still see this as uh, as a decision. Like I was with like you back and forth, um, and at one point I thought like split decision Petrovsky. Like this is anyone's fight in my opinion. Um, they're both really good grapplers, and I think that kind of negates everything. It's it's about who's going to be the aggressor, um, and like you highlighted, Petrovsky tends to be the aggressor as opposed to just uh, laying on his opponent. So yeah, yeah I can un- totally understand where you're going with. Uh, Petrovsky, but I, I feel like, you know, Rose kind of threw me for a loop last last week because I usually go with her and she lost. So I'm going to go with Maximoff in this one just to try to break my curse. So we're on different sides with this. Yeah, just to start the card. First fight in. Yep. Let's move on to the second fight on the card. We got uh, Carlos Candelario going up against Tesoro Tyrar. We got a men's flyweight matchup. And first, we got the Canon Carlos Candelario. Then we got Tesoro Tyrar. This is a rescheduled bout from two weeks ago. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, just like you said, um, there are a couple fights that we've already talked about on this card, and this yeah. is being the first one. Uh, both are making their UFC debut. Uh, both are talented fighters. But what stands out to me is... Um, Tayara, uh, Tayara's ability to get the fight to the ground and how high his fight IQ is at just 22. 
Uh, Candelario has a good ground game, but I feel like Tyara is going to use his reach advantage to rack up uh, volume early in the rounds before getting the fight to the ground, and that's where he's going to do most of his damage. Um, I have uh, Tatsuro Tyara by a third round submission. I think it's going to be an arm bar. I got uh, Tatsuro by a second round knockout on this one. Uh, I nice. feel like it's going to be a battle of uh, uh, Tatsuro Tyara trying to keep the fight on the on the feet to Candelario trying to get the fight to the ground. Candelario has good grappling. He has uh, hard hidden hands, and he knows uh, how to transition well. Whereas Tesoro Tyar, he's 22, he's very young. But if you watch the last three or four uh, fights of his uh, uh, career up until uh, this fight, he's been able to have great movement. He moves around well. He throws a lot of leg kicks. Yep. He has good overhand uh, hook sh uh, shots and a decent jab. And then whenever he uh, stuns his opponent, he's able to grapple up to him right away transition to the back and get that uh, rear naked choke. That's kind of been his signature thing the last two or three fights. He hits yeah. him with a shot, takes the back, and then subs him. And But I feel like he's not, he's not going to this fight. I feel like he's going to get that uh, that knockout shot. Uh, I think he goes for the uh, for the choke. Uh, Candelario fights him. He gets him down, and then he mounts on top of him, and then Tyara finishes him with punches uh, before the the rep stops the fight uh, he's just very vicious with his striking uh this could be a close fight if candelario can uh, grapple with them and take the fight to the ground but if he doesn't i feel like he's gonna have a tough time dealing with the speed and the movement of uh tesoro tyr so i got the newcomer picking up the second round knockout yeah it's kind of crazy with this card like usually we see cards where there are some really like mismatches yeah. where this one it's really like anybody's fight in most of the the um, the matchups in, in yeah. my opinion at least i feel like we could see a lot of split decisions in this uh in this card if this if a lot of the fights go to the judges yeah i agree but uh we're both on tyr in this matchup yeah let's move on to the next fight on the prelims, we got a women's strawweight matchup between Verna uh, Janji Joba going up against Angela Hill, uh, a big time veteran in the division. Uh, who do you got uh, in this fight, and then what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, man, this is another tough matchup. Um, Janji Joba is either going to submit you or is going to take the fight by decision. Uh, Hill has been a decision fighter. Uh, going to the judges eight out of her last ten. This depends on who can control the ground more, in my opinion, who has uh, more active in the cage. If it comes down to volume, I feel that Hill is going to get the win because she throws a lot more than Jandrodoba. Um, but if Jandrodoba gets the fight to the ground uh, in each round, it's going to be a long night for Hill. Although Hill is also very good, under not very good, but she's an underrated wrestler has good takedown defense too. I think it's at 78% right now yeah. um, for having, what, 24 fights under her belt. Um, I know she's lost a lot of fights um, recently out of her last five. I think she's one in four her last five, Angie Hill. Um, but that was to former champions, contenders. Um, I'm going to go with her in this, this fight, Angela Hill, uh, by decision. Um, I think she's going to survive the takedowns and she's going to be more active on her feet. And then she's going to, this is going to be a split. I think this is going to be the first split of the night, uh, Angie Hill. Yeah. And with this matchup, uh, of course, Janji Doba, she's coming in. She's been developing her hands the past few fights. She has those overhand shots. She's very tall for the division. And yeah. she uses that to, with the reach to connect on a lot of those shots. But she's predicated on her uh, grapple and uh, she likes to reach in, get those, uh, uh, he clinch up, clinch up, uh, and then she t tries to look for the submission entries. Uh, a lot of times, she will drop down to uh, guard, even even if it, she's uh, goes to the mat just to get the submission lock on. And then you got Angela Hill. She's all about the movement and the, the picking it apart on, uh, with the striking. She hits you with all angles. 
hits you in the head, hits you in the body, hits you on the on the legs from any spot. And hey, she racks up a lot of volume, but she doesn't have a lot of sting to it. It's more so just touching you up and going. Yep. And she has struggled, but these are the type of fights that she gets where she gets back in the wing column because uh, she has to have uh, deal with the striking of her opponents. Uh, I don't think Janji Dope is going to present too much on the on the feet. She does have that knockout capability, but I uh, we we seen in the past it, it's damn near impossible to knock out Angela Hill. So I don't yeah. see that happening. I I see uh, Angela Hill by decision being the most likely outcome, as long as she can avoid the submission attempts by Verna Janji Doba, she should cruise to an easy decision victory because I don't think the volume is going to be anywhere close. I think uh, as long as the if, uh, she stays on the feet, Angela Hill is the pick. If Werner and J.G. Doba can get the fight to the ground or in the clinch for a long period of time, then you're going to have to worry about this fight. But I got Angela Hill uh, defending the takedowns well and getting the easy decision victory. Yeah, I'm right there with you, man. Hill can go for 100-plus strikes yeah. where J.G. Doba will throw 17. Um, just because of the evolution in her game, she's not that not that um, accurate as a striker yet. But yeah. Hill's Hill's Muay Thai is really good. And like you said, that touch and go style, it's enough to just kind of point fight your way to a victory. Um, I'd like to see Angela Hill get back in the wing column because yeah. as we've talked about multiple times uh, when we break down Angela Hill fights, I think she's been the, the victim of some pretty poor uh, decision making. Yeah. Um, at the end of uh, the cards, but that's how it is. Yeah, but I think what makes this fight even better is the fact that Werner has that reach, and yeah. she's very tall. So I think that's what makes this fight even more uh, interesting, because if, if she, they were a similar size, uh, to me this would be no questions asked, but uh, with the reach uh, advantage, uh, J.J. Dobre can use that to clinch up easier and to hit her with those uh, the bombs from a distance. So that's what yeah. kind of takes this fight back down to reality a little bit. But even then, I still go Angela Hill. Yeah, that's why I kind of thought this would be a split, just because of that reach advantage yeah. and uh, the, you know, the threat of the takedown. But other than that, we move on to the next fight. Another rescheduled about... Uh, we got Michael Johnson going up against Alan Patrick in the lightweight division. As you see right there, the menace going up against Nuget. Uh, what are your thoughts on this fight, Jim? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, this was another one we've talked about. And initially, um, when we talked about it, I think you can go back about two weeks, we talked about this. Um, I felt that this was a possible end of contract fight for both of these fighters. Yeah. Um, and, and I believe I went with uh, Alan Patrick. Um, I'm going to change my decision on this one. Um, and I'm going to go with Michael Johnson by decision. I believe he's going to be more active on the feet and he does more damage in the clinch. And there's always that threat of the takedown with him. Um, yeah. Even though he, you know, we're used to seeing him, you know, our late, you know, our most recent memory of Michael Johnson is being dominated by Khabib. Um, but I believe that Michael Johnson's going to pull out a win, even though he's been, um, you know, hasn't won in a very long time, but I think he wins this fight by decision. Yeah, both of these guys were really good with their grappling, but where I give the edge to Johnson is his uh, is his hands. I think he has knockout power, and that's something I think Alan Patrick struggles with. And I believe uh, Patrick's defense isn't the uh, in the elite. I think he has a lot of room for improvement. They both do, but. I feel like when you come back to these two fighters, I give the edge to Johnson because I feel like he can knock out Patrick. Even if he's losing uh, the grappling battle, he can get in there and get that hair mirror shot and connect on it. Whereas Patrick, I feel like has to fight more of a uh, finesse style fight where he's more so trying to touch up Johnson move and then look for the entries for the takedown. And with that, I feel like Johnson's going to be the more uh, lenient fighter. He's going to let uh, things happen. He's not going to stress too much. And he's going to wait for Pat, uh, Patrick to make a mistake. And then that's when he's going to capitalize. So I'm going with Michael Johnson, uh, round three knockout. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I can honestly see that happening too. 
I think uh, Johnson has a pretty good gas tank, and yeah, I think he can get it to the late rounds. Yeah, he, he's he's not the the same person that he was uh, five or uh, to eight years ago when he came out the Ultimate Fighter, but he had a long uh, like hill to climb to make it to the UFC, and he's had his good moments in the company, and I feel like he's just looking to get that last uh, shining moment before he calls it quits. I agree. I mean, this is a guy who's fought Khabib. He welcomed Justin Gaethje to uh, the UFC and was was winning that fight until the very end. Um, yep. So he does need that one final feather in his cap, and then I think he can ride off into the sunset. Yep. Let's move on to a women's flyweight matchup here. We got Viviana Arroyo going up against Andrea Lee. We got VD versus KGB. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? I like this fight a lot. Um, I think Lee's been up and down over her last five fights, but seems to be putting it together. Uh, Arujo uh, hasn't fought in a year. He's coming in off a loss. Um, and both land about five strikes per minute and are good on the ground. They both enjoy the takedown. Um, Arujo attempts more takedowns, but is also more hittable. Her striking defense is, um, is lacking, uh, for lack of better words there. Um, both throw a high volume, but I think Lee's accuracy and pressure is going to be the difference maker. I have Angela Lee by decision. The one thing that I hope that she worked on is um, she she's one of those fighters that kind of gives away that the strike is coming with like a noise, kind of like Holly Holm does and uh, yeah. Macy Barber does. They they do that little, I don't, I'm not going to do it on, on live, but they do a, they, a little, there's a little tick before a strikes coming, and I hope she's uh, kind of addressed that because uh, if she puts puts it all together, I think Andrea Lee uh, could be a, a title contender at some point. But if she keeps giving, has these little tells and her striking, you know, she's going to be easy to pick apart. Yeah, in the past five fights, Andrea Lee has been on streak. She's on the two fight win streak now. Yep. Before that, she lost three straight. But if you go back at those three losses, two were by split decision. Yep. And then the other one, uh, to me, probably should have been split decision because in those three fights, she poured in a lot of volume. She had over 100 strikes. but it, And then she was able to get the, the grappling going. But she just, for some reason, she was, it was, she was itched, inched out the victory there. So this is a fighter that if you take one or two of those decisions and flip it to her way, we're talking about a very different fighter here that instead yeah. of uh, being hit in the bottom half, she could be in the top five right now. And that's how well she's done in the UFC. It's just that she didn't have luck on her side there. But since then, uh, she went for Antonina Shevanko. Yeah. She pieced her up in the first round with the leg kicks to the side, and then she clinched up with her judo background, was able to take her down several times, and then had her locked into that triangle hold for the last second half of the of the second round before she was able to transition and get that uh, an armbar victory over her. She dominated that fight. And then she comes in last fight against Cynthia Calvillo and showcases a total different side of herself where she didn't grab her at all, and she just pieced her up with her striking, mm -hmm. with the leg kicks, the, the hands, she had a lot of volume, and she won by uh, Dr. Stoppage in round two. Yeah. Whereas on the other side, you got Vivi Vivian Arroyo, who is very good with the boxing. She predicates herself on the jab to the hook. Those are, those are her two primary strikes that she throws. And then she does have the grapple, but she's been kind of uh, inconsistent with it, in my opinion. A lot of times she unsuccessfully gets them and then she abandons it and she focuses more on her striking like I said with the jab and the hook and she she was taken down by I believe it was Chuke in, in the last fight and we know how Chuke is uh, with her striking she can kind of minimize what you do and use that reach and then she's just been hit or miss the one in one fight should be great the other should show, show room, room for improvement I think where the uh, I'm going with this one is uh, is I think the fight gets taken to the ground, and, and that's where Andrea Lee 
is prominent with her entries to submissions, her locks. And, and I feel like her overall fight game is more uh, broader than Arroyo. Arroyo to me is just a boxer who can grapple, whereas Andrea Lee has a judo background, a jiu-jitsu background, and a kickboxing background. And both of these people are going to pour in a lot of volume in their fights. The, but I feel like Andrea Lee is going to find a way to take down Vivian Arroyo. She's going to lock her in one of those triangle holds. And I could see either a triangle victory for her or I could see a win by decision. It, it depends on how well Arroyo does defend in this, uh, the submission entries. But uh, I got I got Andre, Andrea Lee winning this one. For right now, I'm going to say decision, but I feel like she could get a submission victory uh, round two or late round three. All right, so we're back on track. Another uh, dual pick for us. Yeah, and she's going to take that three-fight uh, losing streak and raise it with a three-fight win streak. Yeah, I agree. Let's move on to the next fight uh, on the card. We got a men's uh, flyweight matchup between Jake Hadley going up against Alan Nascimento. We got White Kong versus Puro Aso. Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Well, first of all, those pictures are hilarious. Yes. Um, Jake's picture is ridiculous. Um, and Alan doesn't even look like a fighter in his picture. It just looks like a model headshot. But yes. again, that's topology's problem. That's not what we're here to talk about. Um, this is a good matchup between two really good contender series fighters. Um, Hadley has the ability to submit you or knock you out, while Nascimento uh, is more of a submission artist. Uh, Nascimento has underrated hands, but I think Hadley has the power advantage, um, which I believe is going to be the difference maker. Um, and I have Hadley getting the fight to the ground um, and winning by second round ground and pound stoppage. And just like you said, uh, Nascimento has the jiu-jitsu background. He looks for the entries in the submission. And that's his game, get the fight to the ground, and look for one of those to make his opponent tap. Whereas Halley has a boxing background uh, that he's been developing, and then he has the, the, the wrestling background. He looks to get the fight to the ground, ground and pound you, but he swarms you. He likes to put the pressure on you. He pushes you back. He moves forward, and then he throws at you. And then if he misses, he drops down and, and transitions for a double leg takedown. And in this fight, I think that his game plan is to just come in and put pressure on Nascimento, make him move him backwards, and then that's when he's going to catch him with one of those overhand shots. I could see this one ending early with a first-round knockout victory by Jake Hadley. I feel like he gets it early. And he gets a highlight uh, victory in the UFC. He has that potential that he's shown in Cage Warriors, where he can uh, not just brawl with you, but it, then he can also grapple with you. I don't even think he gets a chance to grapple with the uh, Nascimento because I think he uh, knocks him out uh, uh, that quick. So I'm going with Jake Hadley, first round knockout. All right. Well, we both got Jake winning his big debut for himself. Yep. But let's move on to the next fight. We uh, on the main card, we got a men's lightweight matchup between Frank Camacho going up against Manuel Torres. Uh, Jim, uh, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? We got the Crank going up against El Loco. Yeah, this was an interesting matchup. Camacho hasn't fought in two years, and he hasn't won in three years. Uh, Torres, on the other hand, comes in riding a three-fight win streak, packs a ton of power. Um, I had Torres winning this fight uh, by second round knockout, but I I could see I could also see him taking the fight to the ground and using his grappling to get a submission win. Um, either way, I had Torres winning, but right now at this moment, I think his stand up is going to be more superior than Frank Camacho's, um, and he lands uh, a knockout punch. Yeah, as you see right there, uh, he has a slight reach and basically the same height. I think the difference in this fight is just the, the movement on the feet. Uh, Frank is going to be looking to get the, the takedown. Yeah, he's going to look to clinch up, and he does a lot of his work there. He's one of those dirty fighters where he looks to get the fight in the uh, deep waters and then 
edges out the victory. He does have knockout power. But then Manuel uh, Torres, he has really good leg kicks, uh, that uh, the snapping leg kicks. He has really good striking, good movement. His uh, grappling is very underrated. Uh, if you watch the Dana White uh, Contender Series, he even get a chance to showcase it because he had uh, got uh, got a knockout victory early in that first uh, first round, and I, I feel like that's going to be something to watch out for in this fight. Is if he looks to grapple, if he looks to just move around, throw those snapping leg kicks to the body or a calf, and then just slow down Camacho and keep him at bay, and then look for the knockout shot uh, as the fight goes on. If he does that, I see uh, Emmanuel Torres by decision. But if he just goes right in there and then goes for the kill, I could see Torres by early first-round knockout. I just feel like against a guy like Frank Camacho, he's not going to have those easy openings as in in the last fight we talked about. And then that's why I have Torres winning by decision. Okay. So uh, this is the first fight where I think it ends early and you – Take it to the full yeah. three. All right, cool. But we're both on Manuel Torres in this. Yeah, big win for him too. Yeah, it, especially in his debut. Absolutely. Let's move on to the next fight uh, on the main card. We have a women's uh, matchup between Caitlin Chugagan uh, going up against uh, Amanda Rebos. This is one of my favorite fights on the card in the flyweight division. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you got winning? Yeah, this is a, a really tough debut at 125 for Amanda Hibas. Uh, both are four and one in their last five, but Hibas is a smaller is the smaller fighter by a significant amount. Um, and Chukagian likes to work from distance, which having that reach advantage and having that height advantage is going to really play to her, her, her hand. Uh, what could be interesting in this is if Hibas takes the fight to the ground using her jiu-jitsu to gain control time. Um, Amanda is a good fighter with a ton of skill, but this move is a little confusing to me, um, where I think she's going to be a smaller fighter in a lot of these matchups. Um, I see her losing this fight. Um, I have Caitlin Chukagian by decision. Yeah, you did hit the nail on, uh, on the coffin with this one. Uh, Amanda Rebass is coming in. She's going to be more of the, the grappler. She has a jiu-jitsu background. She's been trying to develop the striking as it goes on. Whereas Chu Kagan has a very well um, Muay Thai kickboxing background, and then she has very good hands. She she is known for attacking every part of the body in her fights. She she might win a lot of fights by decision, but she's going to rack up the volume. She's going to wear you out by hitting everywhere. She attacks her head, body, legs. Uh, she uh, she predicates herself on on just being precision with every spot. She doesn't she doesn't want to not attack a spot of the body just because she wants to make sure that she wears you out and she makes she slows you down. And, and then w- with that, it usually gets her a, a victory via decision. And that's what she primarily does. But she, that doesn't overshadow the fact that she's pretty good with the clinch too. She likes to clinch up, throw the knees and the, and the elbows in the clinch. Yep. And I think, the, the difference in this fight is going to be the striking. I feel like she's going to be able to d- d- defend the jiu-jitsu uh, 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 rebus where she looks to uh, uh, clinch up with you. She jumps on your back, looks to pull you down. And Chu Kagan is a bigger fighter, and uh, Hebas is going to have a hard time uh, attacking her that way. And that's why I got Chu Kagan by decision. I feel like she just easily uh, get, racks up the volume, she might get taken down once, maybe twice, but it's not going to be enough to overshadow the big striking uh, difference that's going to happen in this fight. And that's why I'm going with Chu King in my decision. Yeah, right on the same page with you. I was shocked when I saw that uh, Amanda was moving up to this weight class. I, I'm not. I'm not surprised because I think she could compete in this uh, weight class because uh, it, it's just that this is a very tough first fight for her. Because not everybody's going to be that big like Chu Kagan is at flyweight. Uh, yeah. And Reboss to me is more of a uh, flyweight than a strawweight. Uh, and I think it's going to be a positive move for her. It's just an unfortunate first matchup for a move up. Yeah, for sure. 
he got the number two contender. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. But uh, let's move on to the next fight on the main card. We got a men's bantamweight matchup between Luis Smolka going up against uh, veteran Davy Grant. We got The Last Samurai versus Dangerous. Uh, Jim, what are your thoughts on this fight? And then who do you have winning? Yeah, this is another interesting matchup to me. Uh, statistically, both of these are both of these fighters are practically even in terms of reach, takedown, strikes per minute, uh, strikes absorbed. Almost every metric, they're practically even. But lately, both have been struggling to get the win. Uh, the difference between the two is Grant is going to uh, is going to the judges, while Smolka was finished in his last fight. Um, Grant has a higher vo- is a higher volume fighter, packs a lot of power. I have Davy Grant winning by second round KO. Um, we've seen him go to war with Cheeto Vera, and we just saw recently what Cheeto did to Rob Font, um, and that you know they've kind of split the the matchup, Davy Grant and Cheeto Vera. Um, I think at this point, Davy Grant's the more dangerous, not no pun intended with his name, fighter than Luis Smolka. And then don't forget in his last fight, he did lose, but he lost a decision to upcoming uh, contender Adrian Yanez. Yes, absolutely. In which, in which they, they went to war against each other with the stand-up game. And then okay. uh, you mentioned Smolka uh, again finishing his last fight. He did get the win uh, in the fight before it, but before he got the the, the stoppage in round two against Quineris, Quineris was having a lot of success on the feet uh, with the speed and striking uh, difference because Smolka is a slower striker than Normor compared to guys like Quineris and David Grant. And, yeah. uh, and, and Quineris made a small mistake, and then Smolka was able to capitalize, get on top of him, and held him down and was able to get the – the the ground and pound finish when he was losing the fight clearly uh up until that putt point and to me Davy Grant is a better fighter than Quineris he's gonna come in there he will take damage to give damage off and he, uh, he puts high in output uh with his striking and then he he's very sneaky and underrated with this clinch game uh he, in a couple of fights, he's had six takedowns and two takedowns, and then he had one, a fight with one takedown. Yeah. He only uses it when he has to. Usually, it's he's clinched up in with his opponent, and then he just rides it and takes his opponent down uh, by luck. But that that option is there for him in fights, and I feel like he can use it against Smolka. So it's another avenue where Smolka has to think about it. You know, whereas I think Davy Grant's just going to be worrying about the the clinch of uh, Smolka. I don't think Smolka's hands are that uh, uh, big of a deal for a Grant to uh, worry about. And I'm with you on that second round knockout here. I feel like he he's uh, way ways ahead uh, better with the hands, and I feel like he's going to rack up the volume, rack up the damage. And get the the knockout on Smolka and move his way back up the rankings after the two fight losing streak. Yeah, right there with you. Yep. Let's move on to the next fight on the main card. We have hit the co-main event of the evening. We got a light heavyweight matchup between uh, Ryan Span, aka Superman, going up against Ian the Hulk Kutilaba. Jim, what are your thoughts on this co-main event? And then who do you have winning? The battle between DC and Marvel in terms of nicknames, I'll tell you that. Yes. Um, I think that this is a great matchup. Um, Span, in most of his fights, has the significant reach advantage. He has the power, but at times he's reluctant to strike, where Kudalaba is an aggressive fighter who can knock you out and work you on the ground. Uh, He landed eight takedowns in his last fight. But I don't think this fight will be like the last one because Span has an underrated ground game and he's not going to be taken down eight times. He's not going to be dominated like his uh, Kudalava dominated his previous opponent. Um, I'm going to go with the underdog on this one. I think this might be my first underdog pick. I'm going to go with Ryan Span by third round knockout. I'm going the complete opposite direction from you. I saw your eyes. I knew you were. Yeah, we we got Ryan Span. He he has the knockout power. He has good hands, 
but then he has the jujitsu background. Uh, he he wins a lot of his fights by guillotine choke. Uh, if you look at the history, uh, it, it just happens he's won a lot of them by guillotine choke. Yep. He uh, catches his opponents off guard, and it's more of like a defense mechanism uh, for him. And he's connected on a lot of tap outs that way. But then he has a very bad chin where he's been knocked out several times. Even in a couple of his victories, he's been uh, stunned, but then he came back and won. Whereas Ian Kutalaba has knockout power. He has a really good uh, wrestler, uh, but he has a very bad gas tank. Usually uh, it's because of the game plan. He comes out guns blazing. He pours in a lot into the first round where usually he'll 10 eight. Uh, his fight, uh, his opponent, and he wears out over time, rounds two and three, as evidenced in the Dustin Jacoby fight. He took yep. Jacoby down like four, five, six times in round one, 10 8 at him that round, but then Dustin Jacoby was able to uh, bounce back round two and three, take those rounds, and they fought to a draw. Yep. But then, like you said, he came in and got the victory right afterwards against Devin Clark where he took him down eight times, dominated him on the feet and the ground, and cruised to a decision victory in that one. And before that was the only time that he really got pieced up and when he got knocked down twice by uh, Ank Lyoff. But Kudalaba has been either a decision fighter where he, uh, he racks up a lot of takedowns or he knocks you out really quickly. He's proven that with his hands. And yeah. I feel like this is going to be a first round knockout for Kulaba because I don't trust the chin of Ryan Spann and Ryan Spann has had bad defense, uh, basically protecting his face in the past five fights. Uh, he only has two losses in that span, but he's in three or four of those fights. He's been stunned. And I guess a guy like Kulaba with those knockout hands that he has, I don't think he's going to be able to recover from those shots. All right, uh, we I beg to differ, but we don't need to argue. That's not that type of nope. show. Nope. We're not going to holler at each other. Nope, not yet. Not yet. No, that's a whole different show. That's KJ After Dark. Yeah, let's move on to the main event of the evening. We got the light heavyweight top five matchup between Jan Jovic, the former champion, going up against Alexander Rakic. Uh, we we got the Rocket going up against the the Polish power in uh, uh, Jan Jovic. Jim, what's your thoughts on this main event? And then who do you got winning? Yeah, this is definitely the number one contender fight between two dangerous light heavyweights. Yes. Uh, Blahovic wants to get his belt back. Whereas Ratchik, or Rakic wants to get his shot at the belt. He wants, he wants Glover. Uh, this close is fight. Uh, this is a close fight in my opinion with both having an equal chance of winning. Um, in Jan's last fight, he was four, and that was obviously against uh, Israel, not Israel Asanya, um, against share. Glover. Yeah, um, he was forced to throw over 100 strikes, and uh, that was a, this, not his last fight, his fight against Izzy, he was forced to throw 100 strikes and was able to land some takedowns. Um, whereas Rajik isn't gonna force you to throw 100 plus strikes. Uh, but what he does well is he uses his leg kicks and body shots. Um, like you said about Chukagian, Alexander does the exact same thing. He attacks the head, the, the body, and the legs equally. He's an equal distributor. Uh, like I said, with this one, I think it's going to be close. But I have Jan Blahovich winning this by decision only because I know that he can go to the uh, five rounds, championship fights um, rounds. I don't know if Alexander can go that far. So I'm going to go with Blahovich in this one. Yeah, I think he only went uh, five rounds once against Anthony Smith uh, when when they had the, the main event uh, a year and a half ago. So I think that's and, and is he? I mean, I mean, uh, Rakic. Oh, Rakic, that's right. Yeah, yeah, Rakic. Whereas Jehovich has gone five rounds two or three times. Yes. Sir. Uh, and, and when he won the fight, and then when he fought uh, Adesanya and to share uh, like with Rakic. He has good leg kicks. He has good movement, but he likes to get in close and get into the clinch because usually yeah, that's where his advantage is with the with the close up combat. And you've seen his fights where some fights go low volume, 
but because of the clinch, it, it, it usually values him in the long run. Whereas Jehovic has that knockout power. He has good movement. He he is sneaky good with his takedowns that he uses whenever he has to. But then uh, he he does a lot with the volume. Uh, you, you you mentioned it. Uh, he had a bad performance against Clover Teixeira because Teixeira capitalized on a mistake by Jan and took him down and eventually subbed him. But uh, Jan did stun Teixeira in that fight, but he didn't capitalize on the movement. Uh, but before that, in the in the Adesana fight, he did hit a throw for over 100 significant strikes, but then he added 85 ground and pound shots from the three takedowns that he had and yeah. cruised the decision there. And then the fight before that, he, he got even more against uh, his opponent, Dominic Reyes, where he just yep. clipped him in that fight and was able to showcase what he could do in, in that uh, late heavyweight uh uh, 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 matchup for the belt, and he's just been so uh, up to last play. He was he was looking so good. He was basically the Charles Oliver of the late heavyweight division, where he started out uh, losing, and then he picked up this winning streak and became a different fighter because he was able to put everything together at once. I yep. just think that last fight was more of a Glover to share was more motivated to win because of his age, and then. He's at the end of his career, and he, he just had that little bit more want in, in the fight than uh, Jehovic had. And I think now Jehovic is going to bounce back. I feel like he can deal with the the pinpoint fighting of Rackage. I think he's going to defend against the clinch a lot better. He's going to be the guy that puts in more volume than Rackage. He's, he, I think he's going to dictate the fight instead of allowing Rackage to and he's going to use all five rounds if he has to because he has the experience. I either got a third round knockout by Jehovic or I got a decision victory by Jehovic. I'm not sure yet, but I feel like he's going to want to get that uh, rematch for the title more so than Rakic is going to want to uh, fight for the title. Uh, Rakic was kind of discouraged when he when Yuri jumped the line and got that uh, title shot over him, even though – Rackage yep. is ranked number one ahead of him, or it was at the time. And I think it's because of the fact that his fighting style is a little bit boring, where, like I said, he likes to clinch up a lot of the time yeah, and make the fight go to the decision, even though he's had a couple of knockouts. And with the, with the fighter, with the, with the power and the skill of Jehovic, I think he's going to be able to deal with that and kind of bully Rakic in this fight rather than being the one getting bullied. Yeah, I'm right there with you, man. I'm leaning towards decision, and you're undecided. But either way, you're going with Blahovic. Yeah, I, th- I think he he has the potential to knock out Rakic, but, oh, but I think I'm leaning towards decision here because I feel like Rakic's chin's going to be able to hold up in this fight. Yeah, I agree, too. That's, that's one of the... The mitigating factors on why I picked uh, Blahovich in decision. Yep, but other than that, that will wrap things up for uh, tonight's UFC Vegas fifty four four card breakdown. Uh, before we get going, I just got a few of my uh, bets that I'm looking at for uh, uh, this uh, Saturday night. The one big one that I'm looking to, forward to doing is. Andre Petrosky, he is plus 290 odds on the card. Uh, with me going with him, I'd be very confident with him. I feel like that's a good a bet to go with because he has big-time odds. Uh, you can put uh, $100 on him or so, and then your cash out to over $300, so you will profit twice as much. And then I'm also going with, uh, of course, Janehovic, he is a shocking plus 190 underdog in this one. So I'm going to go with him with this one. I'm also going to combine them two into a two-fighter uh, parlay with Jehovic and Petrosky. If you bet 100 on both of those guys to win in a parlay, you will cash out at over $1,100 on DraftKings just by betting both of them to win uh, in a parlay by money line. So those are what I'm going to go with right now. I might figure around and go with some small ones 
uh, for the uh, for the card. But those are my two uh, big bets for uh, this Saturday's uh, UFC Vegas 54 card, uh, headlined by Yehovich versus Rakic. Yep. A good but, picks. Yep. But other than that, and before we get going, as always, all I ask for you guys to do, if you haven't done so already, is to uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com slash C slash Cage My IQ. Uh, we're back on the Cage My IQ YouTube uh, channel. So if you haven't done so ever, uh, already, just uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so whenever we put anything out, you guys are the first to get it. And then please smash the uh, the like button down below and then flood the, the comment section with your comments on who you think is going to win at this Saturday night and give us all your input on this card. But other than that, that will wrap things up with uh, today's show. I'm your host, uh, Cage. This is my co-host, Jim. We will be back next week to pre- do our four-card breakdown of UFC Vegas 55, which is headlined by Kevin Vieira going up against Holly Holm. But other than that, you guys have a wonderful rest of your week. Talk to you guys later.